tell you a little bit about my journey about researching and writing about fair trade. Here's a little insider's tip. If you're even if you're mid-career, like I was, if you start to do some work in an, in an area that's relatively new, then you can get up to speed with the full literature in a fairly short number of months. Right? You can read literally like I did everything that there is in the econ lit catalog and be as schooled as possible when it comes to a particular topic. And the topic I decided to research was fair trade coffee. So one insider's tip, get literate in a field that's relatively new. The other insider's tip is if you haven't done your own research yet in that particular field, then enlist a collaborator who has done significant empirical field work in that area. So all of a sudden, you bring a literacy that few people have, and at the same time, you've got somebody on board who really knows their stuff. And as I began to study fair trade coffee about five years ago, I learned a couple of things that were really interesting and also useful to me. The first one was that when you toss around the expression, the two-word phrase, fair trade, at a cocktail party or in the break room at work, what you'll discover is not necessarily that many people understand what you're talking about when you talk about fair trade or fair trade coffee, for example. Sometimes they're aware of it, but it's also often the case that when they hear the two words fair trade, they think that you're talking about fair terms of trade, say, between one country and another. So there's a lot of ambiguity and misunderstanding about what fair trade is when it comes to an initiative like fair trade coffee. Another thing I learned is that people who did know what fair trade coffee was, they didn't know much about how it operated. So even if they were champions, even if every week they dutifully purchased fair trade coffee in their local grocery store or coffee shop, they didn't necessarily have much understanding about what was happening behind the scenes and how big the changes were in the lives of coffee growers, if at all. The third thing that I learned is when you spend a couple of months intensively reading in a particular area, you discover all kinds of illustrations that you can steal from that reading that you can use in your classes. So I would, off the cuff, never expecting to, never even thinking about fair trade coffee at the beginning of class, I would find myself saying, well, you know, I'm doing a lot of reading about fair trade coffee, and let me explain the price elasticity of demand based on what I've learned about fair trade coffee. So here's the fair trade label. And in any country that you travel, if they have a fair trade initiative, you see this fair trade label. Now, each individual nation that participates in the fair trade network has their own version of this logo, this label. In Canada, if you purchase fair trade Canada coffee, it has that logo that you see there with the arm stretched upward, but it says Canada underneath it. If you travel to Poland and you purchase fair trade coffee in Poland, you see the same logo, but it says Poland underneath the logo. And the reason you see the same logo everywhere is because Fair Trade International is the one umbrella organization that oversees the entire fair trade coffee market. So they are the exclusive, exclusive licensors of the seal. They also operate their own independent certifying agency. So when you see that seal on a bag of fair trade coffee, it works in a couple of ways. One way that it works is it gives you the consumer an assurance about what you're getting when you purchase that bag of coffee. So for those of you who this means something to in the room and you know who you are, um, if you've ever seen the good housekeeping seal of approval, you knew that when you purchased that particular product or that particular appliance, you knew that it had the endorsement of good housekeeping as a safe, effective product that you could purchase. So you get an assurance when you see that seal on a bag of coffee. The assurances are that the coffee was produced according to a fairly narrow set of restrictions that govern coffee growing in the fair trade network. For example, all of the growers who work on a fair trade coffee plantation are paid at least the local minimum wage. They also abhor child labor. So when you see that seal, you get some assurances about how this coffee was grown. Another thing that you get is the assurance that fair trade coffee growers are getting at least a minimum price per pound for their product. 
And any time that the market price rises higher than that minimum, they get the market price. And whether they're selling at the minimum price or at the market price, either way, in addition, they receive a 20 cent per pound premium on every bag of coffee. And people in the industry refer to this as the social premium because it's an extra 20 cents per pound that, that they can use and put toward projects in their village, whether it be clean water projects, irrigation projects, medical care or schools, they can use the social premium. The other way that this fair trade seal works is it works a little bit like that iridescent tag that you see when you purchase an officially licensed Major League Baseball hat or an official, officially licensed NCAA football jersey. When you see that iridescent seal, you know that this isn't some knockoff of a football jersey or a baseball hat. You know that this is authentic merchandise. And retailers who sell that authentic merchandise have to pay to the NCAA or to Major League Baseball or to the NFL, they have to pay for the use of that iridescent seal. And the same thing is true here. For example, in the United States, every time that you purchase one pound of fair trade coffee, Fair Trade USA gets 10 cents per pound that stays with Fair Trade USA. So one way to think about fair trade coffee is to think about the decision-making environment that a well-intentioned consumer faces when he or she is in the grocery store, whether it be Whole Foods in Washington, D.C., or Brookshire Brothers Supermarket in Arkandelphia, Arkansas. And the decision-making is this. You see one bag of coffee that doesn't bear the fair trade seal. And it's the 21st century, so you get out your smartphone and you try to find out what the reviews are like of this particular coffee, and you discover that it's delicious. Well, if it's delicious and reasonably priced, normally, other things remaining equal, you might be inclined to purchase that coffee. But what if there's another bag next to it on the same shelf, and that bag bears the fair trade label? What do you do? Well, I know what I would do if these coffees were, according to my smartphone, equally delicious. The roasting was good, the bean quality was good, these would impress my friends when I have them over for dinner. In either case, I would probably gravitate toward the fair trade coffee labeled bag, and why would I do it? Because there's sort of a subtext here, and the subtext is that, oh, if I purchase fair trade coffee, I'm participating in one of the actions that a good person does. I mean, wouldn't you, if these, prices, if these prices were the same for both bags of coffee, wouldn't you be inclined to purchase the good person coffee? Oh, I absolutely would. What's really interesting is there's a large marketing literature now that has discovered that there is a market segment that's referred to as the caring consumer, but that market segment is limited. And because that market segment is limited, then retailers attempt to charge a premium price beyond the cost necessary to cover fair trade. Why? Because it's kind of a form of price discrimination. If the coffees within these bags are identical or nearly identical, then the caring consumers are sort of giving away the fact that they're willing to pay a little bit extra for a pound of coffee as long as they're given the assurance that there's a compelling reason to do so. But you and I know as economists that demand curves slope down. So there's an interesting subsection of this marketing literature that tries to identify exactly just how price inelastic the demand curve for caring coffee, for fair trade coffee, in fact, is. Will consumers pay an extra 10%? Maybe. Will they pay an extra 20%? That's less clear. So there have been some cool experiments that researchers have done where in the student union on a major university campus, they've gotten permission to tinker with the relative price of coffee that's not labeled as fair, tra fair trade, and coffee that is labeled as fair trade. But it's hard to be a caring consumer. So many decisions to make. Because that caring consumer market segment, there are actually a lot of choices that you could make in that grocery store aisle. It's not just a delicious coffee that's not fair trade, or the coffee that's delicious that is labeled fair trade. There are also organic coffees that you might see next to the fair trade coffee and the delicious coffee. 
There are also rainforest-friendly coffees that are next to those. And so what's a caring person to do? I don't know about you, but I'm not going to triple my monthly consumption of coffee. Or maybe I could rotate, right? I could keep a little checklist on my smartphone, and every time I go in, I buy the next one. So that I'm always doing the right thing, um, and I'm investing my money in what I think are good causes. So what is it about fair trade coffee? I don't know how familiar you are with the fair trade initiative, but coffee was the first fair trade product, and it's currently the biggest fair trade segment. Since the advance of fair trade coffee as an initiative, you can now buy fair trade tea, fair trade chocolate, fair trade sugar. You can even buy fair trade beer if you're so inclined. Google it and you can check that out. So here's what the market price of coffee, coffee looks like. And these are spot prices from the New York Coffee Exchange. And this is since the beginning of the fair trade movement. And the fair trade movement got going in the late 1980s. Why did fair trade start in the late 1980s? It's because prior to that time, the producers participated in a quota system. During the 1960s, the United Nations brokered an agreement between coffee growers and other nations called the International Coffee Agreement. And what this did in the 1960s is it put a quota for each coffee producing nation on how many pounds of coffee they could bring into the market every season. So in this case, you can talk with your students about monopoly power and how quotas work. But what happened is in the late 1980s, Western developed nations like the United States began to be less concerned about communist threats in coffee-producing nations. So the International Coffee Agreement, it fell apart. And this set the stage for the fair trade coffee movement. Now, there are two lines in this diagram. The orange or gold line, depending on how this showed up, that's the market price of coffee. And you can see that there are two things that are true about coffee. One is that over 30 or 40 years, the market price of coffee has on average been quite low. The vertical axis shows you the price in pennies per pound that coffee growers get on the, on the commodity exchange. And you can see that the average, even though it fluctuates widely over that range, you can see that the average price is probably about $1.30 per pound. The other thing that you'll notice is that, wow, those commodity prices move around a lot. And when coffee prices fluctuate, especially when they spike, it's normally because of one of four reasons. There might be bad weather. There might be bad weather. A third possibility is that there's bad weather. And a fourth possibility when coffee prices spike is that there might be bad weather. So all of a sudden, you have a nice data-driven example of what happens when there's a supply-side shock because of a natural event. And that's really helpful, and we'll model that in a second. The other thing that I know from my economics is that when prices rise, they send a signal. They induce a supply response. And what has happened over and over again is every time there's a spike, like those two spikes in the middle of the 1990s, it's followed by a bottoming out of the market price of coffee. Why is this? Well, two reasons. One reason is that the weather has improved. The other reason is that nations that currently weren't growing a lot of coffee see this rapid increase in the price per pound of coffee, and they're well positioned in terms of climate, the opportunity cost of what they're doing instead has become relatively high, and they shift into growing more coffee. This is what happened in the early 2000s. Vietnam in the 1990s wasn't a significant coffee-producing nation, but having seen those two spikes in the mid-1990s in 94 and 97, they moved into the market rapidly in order to increase their production and try to compete with the other growers who were receiving a high price. But these increases in supply, they don't happen right away. We know, just like most other commodities, in the short term, the price elasticity of supply is relatively low. But as time passes, it's possible for the supply to become more price elastic. In the specific case of coffee, you can't grow more coffee immediately when the price rises. You have to plant new coffee plants, 
And the number of years it takes for those coffee plants to mature is between two and five years. So there's a significant lag between the spike in the spot price of coffee and the increase in supply that always follows as a consequence. So you can use this, this example as a way to powerfully illustrate not only the price elasticity of demand, but also the price elasticity of supply in your classes. I know often we sort of focus on the total revenue test and we focus on the demand curve, but both curves matter a lot. And in markets where both demand and supply are simultaneously price inelastic, then even little tiny movements in one curve generate big changes in the market price. So let's do an example. Suppose that the price of coffee is to begin with is relatively low, and we start out at P0, and then we shock the market with, I don't know, bad weather in South America. So we move that supply curve, we shock it and we move it to the left. There's a decrease in the supply of coffee, and because supply and demand are both relatively price inelastic, then the market price of coffee moves rapidly to a higher equilibrium. So that's what happened with those spikes in 94, 97, and the more recent spikes in 2012 and in 2014. It's also helpful at this point to remind your students that the demand for coffee is also relatively price inelastic. I have it on good authority that the price of coffee in between sessions here at EconEd is zero dollars. But I don't know that I'm going to drink all the coffee that I can hold, especially if I'm giving a talk uh, in, in 20 minutes. <laughs> Another reason to think about these elasticity issues in your class and talk about them is there's a fairly narrow range, a latitude range of the planet where you can grow coffee. And you could grow coffee in Ohio, but it would be really, really expensive. You'd have to construct large greenhouses. It would be extremely costly to grow coffee in Ohio. But there are, there's a fairly wide latitude range where you can grow coffee. In addition, that particular range that researchers refer to as the bean belt there are millions, if not billions, of poor people living in those particular latitudes. So even though the price elasticity of supply is relatively inelastic over the short term, it can be, in fact, quite elastic over the longer term because poor people with a low opportunity cost of their time are quite eager to shift into coffee production when the market sends a price signal for them to do so. But what are the results? I mean, ultimately, yeah, it's nice to buy coffee in the grocery store because you're a good person. And how might that pay off to you personally? Economists have thought about this also, right? When I buy fair trade coffee, I might be doing it because I like to do good things. Now, I don't know the poor coffee growers who are behind the label. I can't see whether they're making significant advances or not. But at least I'm digging a little deeper into my pocket, and I'm doing the right thing. Economists call that the warm glow effect. Another reason that I might buy the caring coffee is because I'm investing in social capital. Not only do I like to think of myself as a good person, I really like it when other people think of me as a good person. So if I have students over at my house for dessert on a Thursday night, and I say, hey, would you like a cup of coffee? Come into the kitchen with me. If they see the fair trade labeled coffee, they're going to think, oh, Professor Clark, he's a good guy. He cares. And this might pay off for me. It might pay off for me in a more manageable class, better ratings on RateMyProfessors.com, <laughs> and even higher evaluations at the end of the semester. So those things are nice things. Or even in my social groups, right? If I have friends over from the community and we have coffee, if they see that I'm, that I'm sharing and, and making available to them the fair trade coffee, they may think, oh, yeah, Victor, he's, he's sort of quiet. Shy, he's, he's an economist, we know he's an introvert, that sort of goes with the territory, but he's a really good guy because he's paying a little extra to buy the fair trade coffee. So let's make our focus for the final couple of minutes here. How are we doing? What is fair trade accomplished and how has it accomplished this? Well, behind the label, there are some details of the fair trade model that I wasn't aware of when I first started reading about it. And my suspicion is that most people haven't heard about the details of the fair trade model. So here are a couple of surprises. One surprise is that it's really expensive to join the fair trade network. And remember what our focus is here. It's to help 
core coffee growers connect with circles of exchange that pay a higher price than the going market price. When you join the fair trade network, when you try to become a member supplier of Fair Trade International, you have to pony up for the application fee $600. And this $600 is collected from cooperatives of small coffee growers. Now, at first glance, this seems counterintuitive. If your goal is to make people richer rather than poorer, why would you ask them to come across with $600 in application fees at the front end? Something else you may not know is that even once a cooperative of coffee growers has successfully been admitted to the fair trade network, there's absolutely no promise that there is a willing buyer on the other side of the market who will purchase that grower's coffee according to the fair trade contract. In fact, in one notorious case, one cooperative of coffee growers that joined the fair trade network, they searched for eight years until they found a coffee importer in a developed nation who was willing to purchase their coffee according to the contract. A third thing you may not know, and advocates, champions of fair trade aren't shy about this, in any given year, only a fraction of coffee grown by the fair trade growers is actually sold as fair trade coffee and ends up in your house with the fair trade label on it. Instead, because there is insufficient demand, most coffee grown even by the fair trade coffee growers every year, it ends up in the conventional coffee market. So if you've drunk a cup of coffee or two today, there's a chance that even if it wasn't labeled as fair trade, it may very well have been grown by a fair trade coffee grower. A fourth thing you may not know is that in some ways, counterintuitively, fair trade coffee may in fact exacerbate income inequality. If you get the data directly from Fair Trade International, what you'll discover is that for-profit importers of fair trade coffee living in nations like the United States and Western Europe, when they buy coffee, they tend to buy it from already established growers who are already growing high-quality coffees and who don't live geographically very far away because they want to do the right thing and be able to use the fair trade label to sell their coffees, but they don't want to do it if it's too costly. So in one recent year, the nation of Peru, where the per capita income is low, and it's about $4,500 per year in Peru, they sold 25% of the world fair trade coffee. Tanzania, where the per capita income is about $500 per year, they're also a fair trade supplier, but they supplied just 4% of the total fair trade crop. So you enrich coffee growers in places like Peru at the expense of even poorer coffee growers in places like Tanzania. Finally, now that we've had fair trade going for three decades or so, we finally have some long-term studies. Um, one particularly striking study was a study called the Hohenheim study. If you Google, Google that, it'll come right up. The Hohenheim study, it tracked the progress of Nicaraguan coffee growers over 10 years. And the control group was conventional coffee growers, and the experimental group was a cooperative of coffee growers who had joined the fair trade network. And they looked after 10 years to try to assess what the standard of living was like, what the quality of life, life was like in their villages, and they discovered something striking. The fair trade coffee growers were actually worse off at the end of the 10 years of participation in the fair trade network than, they, than their non-fair trade county counterparts. Why was this? Well, I mentioned that it cost $600 to join the network. The piece that I left out is you have to pay annually to have Fair Trade International come in and inspect your coffee growing situation. And that annual fee ranges, depending on the size of your production, ranges from about $1,300 every year to about $4,000 each year. So this is an ongoing subscri subscri <laughs> subscription price, a membership fee, that you have to pay in order to maintain that relationship with the Fair Trade Coffee Network. So even though those Nicaraguan coffee growers were selling coffee at a slightly higher price than the market price, they weren't able to recoup their investment in the fees. So let me try to end on an optimistic note. And the optimistic note is this. If you're a good person, 
And I think all of us in this room are good people. Don't you? <laughs> if we are good people, then what we want to do is we want to make a difference. We want to be generous, we want to be thankful for what we have, and we want to share it with others so that they make progress in a lasting, sustainable way. So one of the suggestions I make to my students is to simply drink the coffee you like. Shop for coffee just like you shop for any other good when you go into the grocery store. And then with the money that you save, because fair trade coffee is really expensive at retail, with the money you save, keep a jar or a coffee cup on the counter. And every time that you make a pot of coffee or you brew a cup, put a quarter or 50 cents or a dollar into that jar on the counter. And at the end of three months or six months, take that money that you've saved and give it to an NGO that you know is doing really powerful work investing in the lives of the poor and investing in the things that lead to long-term growth and development, better nutrition and clean drinking water, better education, and the tools to do the job, better physical capital. Thanks very much, and I'll open it up for questions.